FTMIG welcomes Gerard Barron, CEO and Chairman of the Metals Company, to the Morning Drive. Gerard Barron is on a mission to help wean humanity off of fossil fuels and transition to a circular resource economy. Thanks for joining me. Delighted to be here today. Yes, so I was looking at uh, your journey in life, um, <laughs> in business, and it seems like you, you have quite uh, the experience and you definitely like a challenge. <laughs> And that's going to come uh, in use for this company that you have now that you've been a part of for a while. Yes. Um, so can you just sort of give the audience a brief little overview of, of where you started in business? Sure. So, <clears throat> well, I hail from Australia. I grew up on a dairy farm and I realized dairy farming wasn't for me. <laughs> and uh, so I started my first company when I was at university. Um, I remember in year one, I had four jobs and I thought, you know what? There's no room for another job, so I need to rethink this money-making business. And so I came up with an idea that, that worked pretty well. And from there on, I've been building companies. And I was manufacturing automotive batteries in China back in the early 90s and distributing them throughout Europe and Australia. Uh, I started a telco business, which I sold to, to Singtel. And in 2001, I started a, a, a co-founded a software as a service company, which I I grew to 30 countries. And now that's all led me to the, uh, I guess the biggest challenge of my life. And that is as uh, the CEO of the metals company. Very disruptive mining company. Um, why did you initially get involved in this? You know, I've got to be honest. Initially, I was attracted to the uniqueness of getting metals out of the ocean and the disruptive nature of it. And, right. uh, you know, I'm, I'm drawn to contrarian views. And so originally it was as a financial investor. Right. And uh, the, the, the guy who started the business I'd been friends with for decades. And I'd been involved in another company um, where I'd invested and it worked out well. But then in about 2014, I started to spend more time around the science behind climate change. And I started to realize that, you know, decarbonization was absolutely required. And that was going to lean on metal supply. And I started to look at metal supply and realized that we were going to run into a, a massive problem. And that is what the human cost and the environmental cost of getting more metals was going to be. And so it kind of became my crusade. I, I then started to spend more time in the company and then I decided that it needed a management change and a strategy change. And so in 2017, I stepped in as chairman and CEO with, uh, you know, and, and set the company on a different course. And so, and that's what has led us to where we are today. Brilliant. And the market is really starting to come to you now. Um, you know, there's been a lot of catalysts. I think your, your vision, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago uh, is starting to come to fruition now. Mm. You've had to spend a lot of money on, <laughs> on science. Yeah. There's a lot of regulatory, um, you know, <clears throat> compliance stuff there. Do you want to kind of get into how the company has tackled that? Sure. Well, you're right. If you go back to my pitch decks around this business almost a decade ago, you know, we were talking about you know, the need for more metals. And, and back then we focused on uh, population growth because we still have an expanding population. We're focused on industrialization. The fact that, you know, people in poverty don't want to be in poverty and that's going to, you know, require more metals as they move up the standard of living uh, scale. And then on the side, we'd say, and by the way, we're going to move down this decarbonization, which means we're going to need to build all these batteries. And, you know, people would go, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, we get the population and yeah. we get, the, uh, and we get the, the need for more industrialization. But electric vehicles, like, what are they? Tesla was still just an idea. Now, of yeah. course, if you look at it now, everyone realizes that <clears throat> we need to move into more battery driven vehicles. We need to move into more solar and wind and uh, you know, battery grid storage and home grid storage. And so all of a sudden people have realized, oh dear, that requires a lot of batteries, you know, and so uh, and a lot of metals as a result. And so when I took over the company uh, management, I, I, one of the first things I did was I hired a chief ocean scientist onto our board because I've always considered myself an environmentalist and I saw that we had to protect the ocean. And so I, I hired um, 
Dr. Greg Stone, who at the time was the chief scientist of Conservation International, one of the biggest NGOs in the world. And I said, Greg, I need you to come and help me on this because, um, you know, people think of you as Dr. Ocean and, you know, I need you to protect the ocean. And so join the board. And so he did. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that we really had to go down an environmental um, path to, to better understand and to make sure that this was going to be a positive thing for the planet. Right. And um, now in Australia, we have, you know, something called the pub test, you know, does it pass the pub test? And, and, you know, at a surface level, you know, just imagine this right now, we have billions of tons of these little nodules, like the one I hold in my hand. Brilliant. Yeah. And, um, and they literally just lie on the ocean floor like this. And there's enough there on two of our license areas, which is about 1.6 billion tons, to build around 280 million electric vehicle batteries. So it's a really large resource. But just put this picture in your mind. These rocks are literally lying on a part of the seafloor known as the abyssal zone. There is no flora, so there's no plants. And more than 80% of the life that is down there is bacteria. Right. Because there's not much food down there, so you don't find an abundance of, uh, of biomass. So that's one option. And if you want to equate that to a land-based alternative, think of you know, the uh, Atacama Desert or think of a very barren landscape and going in there to pick up these rocks and where you don't have to disturb plants and trees, you don't have to move aside lots of furry animals. Instead, you have to pick them up and turn them into battery metals. And in so doing, you generate no waste and no tailings because we get to use 100% of the mass of this nodule to make uh, materials, battery materials. Now the alternative, imagine the most beautiful rainforest you might have ever seen on BBC documentaries or if you've been to the Amazon or to the Sulawesi in Indonesia. Yeah. Now imagine you've got to tear down all those trees, destroying all of that biomass and the beautiful animals that live within it. You've got to rig up, dig up all the soil and then down deep you find all this metal bearing ore and then you've got to dig it up and process it and you generate a heap of waste you have to dump that waste somewhere mm -hmm. and you have to move out indigenous communities along the way yeah. and that's the alternative and so the pub test is a big pass and so what we then decided is we needed a lot more scientific data and so we embarked on what can only be described as the world's largest environmental research program through the entire water column from the seafloor all the way through the water column to the surface and you know, we've spent more than 900 days now at sea on our license area. And, and by the way, it's like four and a half days west of San Diego. So it's a long way out. And, and I, can I pause you there? Please. Is that in international waters? Yeah, it's okay. in international waters. And so, uh, <clears throat> and, and if we cast our mind back 50 years ago, this very same resource was beginning to be developed. So you had Lockheed Martin and Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, uh, you had BP and Shell, mm -hmm. all part of consortia that were starting to uh, collect these rocks and turn them into metals. They weren't so much looking for battery metals, but they were looking for copper and nickel. And the United Nations stepped in and stopped them because 50 years ago, the world had not agreed who owns the oceans. And so as a result, everyone had to pause and go and do something else. And the reason why now is such an interesting time is because the final regulations that will allow us to move from exploration to exploitation are about to fall into place. And later this year, we expect the regulator, that's the International Seabed Authority, to pass the exploration, exploitation regulations to allow us to submit our application and then to uh, begin the process of picking up these rocks and turning them into battery metals. Do you have any competition in that, in that area? Like, is anyone else going for this license? Well, we, hold, we have access to three license areas and, um, and we're sponsored by three developing countries because to claim an area in these international waters, you either have to be a signatory to UNCLOS or a member of the International Seabed Authority, of which we are not, because you have to be a country. Yeah. But you can also be sponsored by one of those member countries. And 
Back when they were drafting UNCLOS, which stands for the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, they wanted to find a way for the developing nations of the world to participate in this new industry. And so we are sponsored by Nauru, uh, Kiribati, and Tonga. And they're three island nations in the Pacific Ocean. They have a, a heavy dependency on the oceans for their, their well-being. But they're also nations that have contributed nothing to climate change yet they're in the front line to be impacted by rising sea levels and climate change that has been created, of course, by, uh, the, by the West, the developed world. And so it's nice that we get to share those benefits. And so we control three license areas and there are other lic 15 other license holders in the same area. And they include China and Japan and Korea and Singapore and the United Kingdom and uh, France and Germany, um, a company out of Belgium that has the sponsorship of the Belgian government. And so, but we are running front of the pack. We are leading the charge and I suspect we have, are between three and five years ahead of you know, the other parties that are out there uh, carrying it out. So, How much money has the company spent on the science and the research? Well, so far we've spent well over $300 million and most of that has gone in the science and the resource definition work. And, uh, and so we've run 18 campaigns and, one, uh, and a campaign is basically uh, between six and eight weeks long where our boat would sail out to the license area and study the area, study, generate um, and capture the baseline environmental data, um, survey it to better understand the size of the resource and the characteristics of it. So we've run like 18 of those campaigns and then last year, it was a very important year for us because for four months we were out there testing our pilot collector system and that was a big milestone because the hidden gem, which is a boat that is uh, operated by one of our biggest investors, All Seas, was able to harvest these nodules off the seafloor and at a production steady rate, and I guess prove the fully integrated system where we could hoover them up um, using a, an air riser, deliver them to the production vessel. And that boat that you saw us using last year will also be our, our first production vessel. And we had another boat out there for six months, and that boat was out there to do the science observation. And so it studied the area before we started collecting, it studied it during the collecting process, and then it stayed behind to study the impacts of what we'd done. Right. And so it was a really big year for us last year. What were the impacts? Well, there are, I could categorize the things we worry most about into three buckets. And one of them is sediment. And to better understand how will the, the sediment behave on the seafloor and in the midwater column. Because what we do is we, we pick up these nodules, we separate the sediment on the seafloor, leaving it behind, and then we pump the nodules in a mixture of water up to the boat. And we have to return that, some of that water somewhere into the, um, into the ocean. And so that's one area of focus. And, and the results of that were really encouraging um, because what we found, and think of the sediment as like when you drive your car down a dirt track, you kick up some dust. The question is how much dust, what, where will it travel and so on. And what we found is that the sediment only rises around two meters above the seafloor mm. and it sticks together like a cloud and up to 98% of it settles in that same area. And because the particles tend to flocculate together, so they bind together and they become heavier and they settle. Right. So that's encouraging. It means that you know, some of the wild speculation that this sediment might travel for hundreds or thousands of miles is just wrong. Yeah. And then the same in the midwater. Um, we were able to measure that very accurately. And what we found is that, firstly, we removed most of the sediment before it goes back in. And, uh, and the question is, where should we put it? Should we put it at 1,000 meters below sea or back at 4,000 meters? For us, it, the, the, the answer will be where it's best to put it because it doesn't matter how big our return pipe is. And, um, and basically, 
the results of that will be published during the course of 2023. Um, but consistent with another contractor who was out there two years earlier, and they had MIT observing all of their impacts. And, and our results are very consistent with what MIT found, and they published those papers uh, uh, last year. The other thing we worry about is biodiversity. And so, you know, what organisms that do live there, and, and we're talking about um, most of it is bacteria. And so the fact that we pick up these nodules um, with the lightest touch possible using an engineering principle known as the, the Kawanda effect. And so basically as we go over, we, we shoot a jet of water at them, and as the collector head uh, curves upwards, it lifts the nodules. And so it means that we don't have to disturb a lot of the seafloor, only about the top two inches. Mm. And, um, but if there are sea cucumbers or stars there, then clearly that's going to have an impact on those guys. But a lot of the bacteria survives this process. Uh, and so the thing we need to go back and study, which we'll be doing, I hope, later this year, is how quickly does life come back into that area? Now, if we look at the work that has been done by other contractors, what they're finding is that life returns really fast because there's no food down there. And so if you disturb an area, it increases productivity. And so the critters go, ah, activity over here, you know, let's make our way over to somewhere where there's a bit more life. Maybe. And so that's the other thing we think about. And of course, the other one is noise. You know, how much noise will be generated? Um, will it have an impact on any of the organisms living down there? And, and so we had extensive noise studies as part of that sea trial. But so far, all the indicators are that that's something that is, um, you know, well within limit because all the noise happens on the surface. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the harvester that picks up these nodules is electric, and so it's powered by uh, power generated on the vessel with a big umbilical cord attached to it. So not a lot of noise is happening down there, but clearly there's a bit of noise with the nodules coming up the pipe. Um, but so far we, you know, we're very encouraged by those results. So you, you still seem very um, caring about what's going on at the bottom of the seafloor, but and, and I'm not saying that uh, we shouldn't be. But that definitely, what would, what potential damage we could be doing down there seems a lot less than what we were doing up here, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, uh, again, two wrongs don't make a right, but at the same time, we, you know, we're trying to electrify the world here mm, yeah. uh, with EVs. You need, you need this stuff, and yeah. there's probably a more efficient way and a better way to do it for the planet. Yes. Um, Look, I think that's true, and I, I you know, what I was, <clears throat> what I was encouraged, like. Do I love the ocean? Of course I do. Do I love it more than the trees and the plants? No, I love the planet, the right. planet upon which we all live. And yeah. I think what I encourage people to do is, you know, we have to take a planetary perspective. We can't be just thinking about the, the worms that, you know, live amongst the sediment down there without at the same time thinking about the set of impacts that land-based mining is having. And look, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of really responsible good land-based mining projects. But the thing that I worry about is that the main revenue that we generate is from nickel. And mm. if you look at where all of the growth in nickel is coming from, and I mean all of the growth, it's coming out of nickel laterites that are in Indonesia and the Philippines. And just by their nature, they form in wet, very biodiverse habitats where there are rainforests. And so, to get to them, you, you have an enormous environmental impact, plus an enormous human impact. So I think, you know, if we get this, these nodules collected at scale, then we can have a real impact on, on stopping that environmental damage. And I really do believe, you know, people sometimes say, yeah, but will you really slow down land-based mining? Yes, we will. Well, nickel is a very difficult one to find, first of all. Yes, it is. I'm not trying to educate you here, but I, I know a little bit about nickel. Yeah. Um, what kind of grades are you getting? Well, our grades are off the charts. And um, if I put, so this is module is, is rich in nickel at about 1.4%. Can I hold it for a second? Yeah, please. Um, nickel is heavy. <laughs> And it's um, everyone it's like always something from Mars. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, yeah, and we have a 1.1% copper in here, 
about 0.2% cobalt and 30% manganese. But if I put the copper and the cobalt and the manganese all into nickel, we're over 3.2% nickel equivalent. So the only thing that's ever been discovered that I know of that's even close to that is Voices Bay. Yeah, that's Are right. Are you familiar? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. And, and of course that was, that had some rich parts, but of course they go and take all the rich parts first and then you're into the less rich parts. That's right. And that's the problem with land-based mining that if you look at the average grade of copper that was mined last year, it was less than 0.5 of 1%. Now, if I put all of those metals into copper equivalent, we're just under 8%. So this is a, such a rich resource. And, you know, and the fact that we have none of the deleterious elements like arsenic and mercury, it means that when we bring them to shore to process them, we don't generate those horrible toxic tailings and the waste that is causing such a problem to the environment and communities around them. I want to get into the economics here, uh, but I just had a thought of when you were talking about mm. the ocean and so passionate about the earth. This is definitely something a band like Pearl Jam, they're, they're activists for, for the earth. They mm. go around, they travel, they tour, mm. you know, they play their music, but they, I'm sure they would back something like this. Even Bono comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, well, you know, the, um, there's no doubt it is. Okay, so let's get into the economics then. Mm -hmm. Let's get into, you know, at the end of the day, this is a publicly traded company. You're tr you want to try to make a profit. How quick can you get into production once you get your light, your, all the regulatory stuff figured out? Mm -hmm. Very fast. And the reason for that is that we already have our first production vessel. Now, once again, this is one of the real advantages we have over land-based mining because with land-based projects, you've got to build roads and rail and power and water supplies and villages for people to live in because a lot of these mines are in very remote places. Whereas what we do is we convert a boat and we sail it on out there and we're in production in 48 hours. And we're lucky that we've also identified some land-based processing facilities. Um, we haven't announced to the market where yet, but we will this year, where we can ship the nodules and turn them into these battery metals that we're talking about. Uh, without us having to go and spend capex to go and do that. That's always been our goal. Now, it doesn't mean we won't go and build something because you know, you have the Inflation Reduction Act, which of course is there to help um, the North American economy become supply independent of China. And in the Indonesia. And, and Indonesia, that's right, which of course is all controlled by the Chinese. Right. And so it's not to say we won't build something and we'd very much like to build that in North America somewhere. Um, somewhere where there's a large supply of renewable power and so on. But the fact that we don't have to go and spend those billions of dollars to get started, like so many land-based projects do, yeah. has a big impact on our economics. And so, so that boat that you can see, the hidden gem, has the potential to go as high as 3 million tons of production a year. And so, and so what our job is, is to collect it with the uh, greatest efficiency and the lightest impact. And so, um, now it won't start at 3 million tons when we get that boat moving, it'll be a slightly smaller number. Yeah. But, you know, 3 million tons is um, it's a lot of nickel. It's, it's got the, um, that would give us uh, around a, a 40 plus thousand tons of nickel out of those 3 million tons. But at the same time, we'd have almost 30,000 tons of copper. Mm -hmm. um, we Which, have a lot of cobalt and a lot of manganese as well. Yeah. Well, we need copper for sure. That's yeah. under, under demind, uh, undermined. Mm. And um, obviously, again, if we're going to electrify the world, yep. get, you know, we, we need more copper. I think nickel is the best place to be, mm -hmm. right? Because that, that's the main performance driver in an EV battery. That's right. And it's very, very difficult to find. Yes, it is. And, and I've, I'm relieved to see a little bit of commentary now about um, LFP, battery chemistries because everyone said, ah, uh, oh, you, know, you know, LFP will be a replacement for nickel-rich chemistries. Look, in some applications, they will be, in some applications. But LFP has a massive environmental footprint as well, and um, particularly the P in the LFP. And you can find out a lot of that online. But we think nickel is the way to go, clearly. And the reason why I think a lot of manufacturers are talking about other chemistries is because 
there isn't a big supply of nickel. Right. So if we can solve that problem, mm -hmm. then I think we're going to see more nickel rich batteries chemistries. And that's good because they offer far better performance, particularly in climates like we're in today yes. in Toronto, where you have a lot of cold weather. Unfortunately, you are right. <laughs> um, Okay, so has industry come to you yet to partner or, or said, hey, if you get if you get past those regulatory hurdles, we're because I know like I've done enough interviews now around nickel and yep. critical uh, minerals that um, I know industry is very uh, interested. Yeah. How, has any of those discussions happened? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, we've um, I mean, we already have Glencore as a shareholder and they um, have an offtake for some of our nickel and copper. Um, we have all seas, of course, who are one of the world's largest pipe layers in the deep ocean. Right. Um, so we initially went to the offshore industry. So we had Maersk and all seas as shareholders. Um, but we have a lot of companies who are at the table right now because, you know, this will disrupt the nickel, yes. the cobalt and the manganese markets. Copper is very big, so we won't touch that per se. But, but our goal is to be number one in those markets and a top 10 copper producer. And so... If you're a land-based mining company, you're sat here with a really watchful eye on what we're doing because we could really change the market dynamics in those metals. Oh yeah, like and do you need security walking around here? Or what? <laughs> I'm well, kidding. yeah. Um, but yeah, okay. So and that makes sense that industry is already so you have an offtake agreement with Glencore. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about your structure. We uh, usually I start off uh, with management and uh, talk about the structure of the company. Mm, yeah. How many shares are outstanding? There's around 280 million shares out. Okay. It's not easy to put you in a box, right? Like if I'm talking to an exploration company, yeah. there's kind of a set amount of outstanding shares where it's like, wow, you're, you know, that's mm. that's a lot, mm. right? But you're you can get to production. It's like you're kind of in a developmental stage, yeah. right? You're not you're not a producer yet, but you can be a producer very quickly. Yeah, that's so right. So that's not too many shares outstanding given where you are. No, and I think the way to think about that is, um, you know, today we have a market cap of just under $300 million. Yeah. Right? As a private company, I'd raise money at a $2 billion valuation. So, you know, we haven't done very well in the public markets, you could argue. But if you look at our underlying assets, you know, the first block that we will develop is the Nori Area D. And that has a net present value in excess of $15 billion right now. And that's 22% of our defined resource. And we own 100% of it. So, so you're starting to put a valuation on it. That's, this is what you put in your deck if you were private. That's right. Ex private. And, we, and, and we are allowed to put it in our SEC documents as well. So, so, so there's a real misfit. And if we were a land-based development project, our valuation would be somewhere between 0.7 times that NAV, so 0.7 times that 15 billion, yeah. to sort of 0.2 times. But instead, we're like one and a half percent of that nav. And so, so there's a big discount that we're getting for being first when, you know, I was thinking we'd get a big premium for being, you know, the first in this industry that's going to disrupt these important metals. Yeah. Uh, so it's been a learning curve for me and uh, for us all. And then, of course, that's just the Nori D block I'm talking about. You know, that's 22% of our defined resource. There's the other 78% we've got as well. And so I guess to help that move forward, we'll end up partnering with people because, um, you know, we've got a lot of options in front of us right now on how we will finance those future operations. Firstly, the good news is we don't need billions of dollars. You know, we've already got our first production vessel. We already know where we're going to send those nodules for processing, uh, where we won't have to spend uh, CapEx. So and it's important to note where, you know, we can produce these metals in the bottom quartile of the cost curve as well. And okay. largely that's driven because of the very high grade and the fact that we don't have to go and put all this enormous infrastructure in place for 10 years before we get started. And yeah, and you're saying that you're about five years ahead of any competitor mm -hmm. that would be out there Correct. doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. But, but I would argue that it might be even more than that because you can't just go there and peg a bit of ocean floor and expect there to be nodules because... You know, this area that where we are, it's known as the clarion clipperton zone, or CCZ. And while the grade is very abundant across this four to 5,000 mile wide patch, the abundances are not. So you can have good ground, 
and you can have not so good ground. Now we're compliant with the Canadian 43101 resource reporting standard. Well, please walk us through, yeah, that how you how you you know you, you you've done these things. Yeah, so it's actually a really handy handy because it's a two-dimensional resource, and if you look at nodules on the seafloor, you can see them. Whereas if we were on land, we'd be drilling holes. Right. First hundreds of holes and then thousands of holes to, to, to try and understand what that structure looked like. Whereas we don't have to do that, we take pictures of it, we survey it, and so we, uh, we then take box calls at regular intervals, like samples, so we can measure the abundance, um, so we can test the grade and study any organisms living amongst them. And so we are, under the 43101 Canadian Resource Reporting, we have 1.6 billion tons of inferred resource. On the Nori D block, we've now moved that to indicated and measured. Mm. And we actually had a 7% a improvement in measured over inferred. And that normally doesn't happen. Normally, as you move up the certainty path, you lose resource. Right. Whereas in our case, we had gained resource gained through it. better sampling. Yeah. And that's because of the two-dimensional nature of it. Right. Like one of the assets of our company is we have almost 180,000 square kilometers of bathymetric survey data, imagery of the seafloor. Final, final thoughts to your current shareholders and potential new, new ones, mm -hmm. or, or anyone? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, what I, I, I hope we see are more shareholders who want to come and be part of this journey, you know, be part of this, this mission. Uh, not often do you get an opportunity to participate in a new disruptive industry. Right. And, you know, it's a feel good story. It's got so many exciting things. I promise you, it'll be one of the most exciting dinner party conversations that you'll have. And, you know, I encourage people not just to become shareholders, but get into the data. You know, understand we've got a, a very rich resource um, on our website. Uh, please, you know, come and understand the science and follow us as we, you know, explore this amazing new world. Well, I'm going to make a promise to you. <clears throat> um, obviously, I, I live in tr around Toronto. Uh, PDAC is one of my favorite conferences. And um, unfortunately, a lot of uh, companies right now have had depressed stock prices, mm. which for a potential new shareholder is not a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to be a shareholder. <laughs> Fantastic. Absolutely. Welcome. I'll be calling my, uh, my wife after this video yeah, and letting good. her know we're going to buy some shares. This is, uh, you're the third company in my, in, I think we've inter interviewed over 300 companies. You're the third company that I've said I'd, I, on camera I would buy shares. Oh, wow. Amazing. But yeah, I want to be part of the story. Um, I want to I be part of your journey. Good. I want to... Um, you know, obviously, like I said, the, the market cap, unfortunately, right now is a little low and you mm -hmm. don't seem that far off from uh, what would be the biggest catalyst for the company is to be able to actually go and do all the work. Exactly. And exactly. what would be a potential timeline? Timelines are timelines, but mm. if you're throwing a dart, where would it land? What month? What year? Look, we told the market that we'd be um, ready for production by the end of 2024. And um, so sometime in 2025, you're going to see revenue flowing through the business. And, you know... It's 2023 now. Yeah, we're not know? far. No, that's right. I mean, these projects take a long time to develop. And, um, you know, we've been at it for a very long time, of course. I mean, uh, our company was formerly known as Deep Green, and we set it up in 2011. But, of course, they've been studying this part of the ocean since the 1960s. You know, and, um, but, but the reason why now is the very exciting time is because those final regulations are about to fall into place. And, um, and that's what's gonna really open up the industry. And I think it's gonna be you know, exciting times thereafter. Absolutely sounds like it. Well, um, I'd like to present you a special gift. And I, uh, like you haven't bought many shares in many of the companies, I don't hand these out too easy either, but uh, no way. But please. Well, thank you kindly. Yeah, thank you very much for that. You're welcome. That's awesome. I can't wait to put that in my office <laughs> and and uh, carry it around at the conference and, and talk to people about this yeah, because yeah. I will be a shareholder. Yeah. Great. And um, that's great. really kind of you. Yeah. Awesome. Cheers. Thank you. Um, so the ticker for for everybody watching is TMC. TMC. We're listed on the Nasdaq. Okay. Fantastic. I think this is a good place to wrap it up. Great. It's been one of my favorite interviews. Oh, good. I mean, my pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, I must say, 
I've always looked at James Corden and thought, that this looks like fun. <laughs> now I've got to do it. Yeah, this is the investor <laughs> side of that. But um, we, we actually took the idea from Jerry, uh, or for, or from Seinfeld. Nice. I, oh, I love that. Yeah, he does the uh, yeah, comedy yeah, in a car thing. And it works. People, it really works on social media. So. Yeah, good. Okay, we'll wrap it up here. And uh, people can uh, get a hold of you through your, probably your IR network on your website. Absolutely. And uh, I do, I have seen other content pieces from you online. So you're always telling your story, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. Yeah. And uh, maybe we'll get an update from you at another conference, maybe in Europe or something like that. Um, It'd be my pleasure. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Take care now. <laughs>